Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Charges Analytics with Arjun. And we are here talking after one of the most exciting yet heartbreaking losses that I think I've ever watched in my life. And today we are not here to talk about any of the stats or analytics behind the game. I think, you know, at this point, we're not even in the playoffs, so I'm not sure people even care about what happened. I mean, if anything, just know that Justin Herbert balled out again and his team just didn't help him at all. OK, so that's all we need to talk about for the stats. We are here today to talk about Brandon Staley. OK, now, if you guys have watched my videos throughout the season, and I, I appreciate you guys if you do, if you have, you would have known or you know that I've been a big Brandon Staley backer, right? Like I have supported him since day one, since he got hired. I have supported him through the stretches of terrible run defense. I've supported him through almost every decision he's made. I keyword almost like there's some things I, I'm not so like totally on board with, but it hasn't been like a big picture. Like I completely disagree with him. So I have been on his side since the season has started. Now that the season's ended and I've had a couple of days to, to really just think through how the season went, I think it's fair that I can talk about Brandon Staley. Okay, we're going to talk about his decisions in the Raiders game. We're going to talk about his decisions, you know, throughout the season. And we're, I mean, we're going to be as neutral as we can, not showing any bias, but let's, let's start with the Raiders game. Let's start with the timeout, because I think that's still on everyone's minds for some reason. I got so pissed off at the discourse. I was so confused at the, the talk on Twitter about this stupid timeout that everyone was overreacting to that I even made a TikTok about it because I needed somewhere to just vent my thoughts. So I'm going to insert the TikTok now so you guys can see it. As a Chargers fan and someone who is heavily invested in analytics, I do not think that Brandon Staley made a mistake by calling a timeout on third and four versus the Raiders on Sunday Night Football. The national media and analysts are going to portray the idea that the Raiders are going to kneel the ball out or just give up with 38 seconds left on the play clock, but that is far from the truth. The media only mentions how there were 38 seconds left on the game clock without accounting for the idea that there were only four seconds left on the play clock, meaning the Raiders had to snap the ball at 38 seconds, 34 seconds, or in between. And if you go back and watch the game, you'll see that the Raiders were in shotgun, not under center, meaning them kneeling the ball was out of the question. And as Mitchell Schwartz pointed out on Twitter, the way that the Raiders offensive line were set they were not set to pass block, they were set to run block, so they were gonna run the ball either way, which leads me to my next point. Before the timeout, Brandon Staley's defense had four defense alignment and two linebackers, one including Kenneth Murray, who finished the Raiders game with a 27 PFF grade. By calling the timeout, Staley was able to substitute Linval Joseph, who weighs 330 pounds and plays the nose tackle role for the Chargers defense, in for Kenneth Murray, who again, had one of the worst games of any player in that game. Staley knew he needed his best run defenders to get a run stop, which is why he substituted Joseph on, because Daniel Carlson has not missed inside Allegiant Stadium since he got signed for, to the Raiders. So anything inside of 50 yards would have been automatic for him, which it was. And if you go on Twitter, all you see are the hypothesis that, you know, the Raiders players were telling Austin Eckler that they would have kneeled the ball out, or Derek Carr telling Michelle Tafoya that, you know, the time had definitely changed their strategy. But does changing the strategy mean changing a play or changing the way that they went about the game? Because it does look like they were gonna run a play before the timeout. So even if, if they picked the first down before the timeout, the media would have been all over Brandon Staley not getting his best run defenders in. So that's why I support Staley in his decision to call a timeout because he was playing to win. And even if a tie got them in, Daniel Carlson would have still made a field goal if the Chargers had not got a run stop before the timeout. And to me, at the end of the day, I think the Brandon Staley hate stems from the old school football guys who don't like his aggressiveness, who don't like his use of analytics, who don't like him going for fourth down inside his own territory, even though that shows a slight win probability edge than punting the ball in that situation. I believe Brandon Staley is a great coach and him and Justin Herbert will have a chance to lead the Chargers to a Super Bowl as long as those two are still on the team. And the last thing to point out is 
even though the national media is going to blame Staley for potentially losing the Chargers, this game against the Raiders, and the Thursday night football game against the Chiefs, you know, they seem to forget that he won the Chargers three games uh, to start the season against the Chiefs, the Raiders, and the Browns by being aggressive and going for it on fourth down. So, as you can see uh, in the TikTok, I, I really tried to highlight like the main points about the timeout and everything that went behind it. And so basically what I was trying to say is like, he didn't call the timeout because he, he was daring the Raiders to win or some of what those conspiracy theorists, what they were putting out on Twitter. He called the timeout because he needed to get his best run defense on the field. And his best, best run defense includes Linval Joseph and not Kenneth Murray. In fact, if, if you asked me to ask me before the game what our best run defense formation was, it was five one five it was bosa jones um linval either tillery or covington obviously i'd want covington or fahoko um fackrell or nuosu and then you have kaiser as as the lone linebacker on, on run formations right and then obviously the nickel package behind him it's the five one five before the snap it was a it was a four two five with kenneth murray on the field and you didn't even have linval joseph on there so you're gonna get gashed either way the the whole point of this timeout that had lost them the game and changed the rate of strategy. I don't know if you like, I'm a lot of you guys are smart. And if you guys don't understand how NFL coaches operate, they don't like Basaccia wasn't having the conversations about tying the game during the drive. He was having those conversations before the kickoff, before the Chargers kicked off. Those conversations you can't have in a 30 second, like, because the offensive coordinator, Greg Olson, he's calling the plays as the play before is finishing right so how is how are they going to have these conversations about time while the drive is going on they had a pre fixed mindset about what was going to constitute a tie which was probably getting stopped inside their own territory and them them saying congrats you stopped us let's both go to the playoffs there was no incentive for them to lose right so obviously they're going to take a tie but tying means they go to Kansas City so they're obviously going to do everything in their power to not play Kansas City, who have absolutely beat the shit out of them the past two times they played them this year. So they're obviously going to go want to play the Bengals, which is why the timeout had no influence, in my opinion, on what the Raiders were doing, because they were already in Chargers territory. The Chargers got a, a, like a tackle for a loss on first down and then allowed seven yards on second down. And that was what changed it. If they got another stop... I think the Raiders would have, would have let the clock run out. But at the end of the day, Brandon Staley's timeout did not really change anything because the Raiders were fixated on winning that game. And, you know, the, they just executed better in the clutch, which has been a story the whole season. Okay. That's about the timeout. The fourth down decisions. The Chargers went, I think, six for seven on fourth downs. And obviously the big one that everyone's going to talk about is that fourth and one call inside the 20 inside their own 20. Now, you know, I've been a supporter of his fourth down aggressiveness. It's something, it's the complete opposite of what we've seen from Anthony Lynn. Full disclosure, I was watching the game with my best friend, one of my best friends, Tage, you know, friend of the podcast, he's been on the podcast before. And so we're, we both work for PFF. We're both very well versed in analytics. As soon as we got stopped on third and one, I looked at it and I told him, Staley's probably going to go for this. I will. I support it if the math shows that he should go for it. There are five big public models on the internet or on Twitter that do that, like put out fourth down decisions on Twitter and uh, you know on their websites. Each model had a fourth and one as a go, which means you know they should have gone for it on fourth and one. It gave them an edge and, and win probability. So. I support the process of going for it. I do not support the process of running two halfback dives like we are in the Anthony Lynn era. I think at least one of those plays, the third down play should have been some type of RPO, should have been some type of quick game, should have been some type of zone read. You have to put the ball in Justin Herbert's hands and not Austin Eckler's hands because he's reliant on the interior offensive line getting a push, but that interior offensive line got dominated in the last Raiders game and they got dominated in this Raiders game. And that's on a whole nother story about how this offensive line just didn't 
help Herbert or this offense at all. But again, I was fine with them going for it. I wasn't happy with the play call. And if you if you want me to explain further why I was happy going for it, um, my colleague, Kevin Cole, who's a data scientist at PFF, he brought up a great point. The Raiders average about two points every single drive. So punting it away, you're you're kind of expecting them to score at least two points. So you're pretty much, you know, you're going to probably allow a field goal anyway. It's better to know what type of situation you're in with more time left. And again, that's the whole go for two down nine. You, if you go for two down nine, you understand the situation. You understand that if we don't convert a two point conversion with four minutes left, we, we know that we have to play more aggressively on defense and offense. But if we convert the two point conversion, we have more information to kind of process and we can make better decisions from there. So look, I think Brandon Sealy in that game alone, he made some game management decisions that were questioned by the public, that were questioned by the analysts, but I didn't really see too much of an issue with the timeouts or the fourth down decisions. It was the play calls that really kind of screwed them in that situation. And the, the last thing I'm, I'm gonna talk about with that is the fact that people want Brandon Sealy fired and it's in its Chargers fans. Again, it's not just the national media. It's not stupid Mike Lombardi who said, you know, GM would fire him based on that timeout call. It's not, it's none of that. The fact that Chargers fans are calling for Sealy's head, even though he led us to a winning record in the second hardest division in the NFL against one of the hardest strength of schedules, you know, with a defense that isn't constructed in his image, is just baffling to me. It really is. And it's like Brandon Staley won us three games by being aggressive on fourth down and going for it early in the season. We would be a six, seven win team if he didn't make those decisions early in the season. So why are we faulting him now when it's more about the execution? It's about the play call. That was a Joel Lombardi thing, right? He didn't call a good fourth down play. And, you know, if we're being honest, like if it was any other game, I think Brandon Sealy would have gone for two at the end of the game after the game, game tying touchdown pass. I think he would have gone for two in any other game, but he was smart enough to understand that the, the goal isn't to win this game. It's to get to the playoffs and you can do that with a tie, which is why he went to overtime. Okay. So that was me kind of being on his side and explaining his decisions. Let's talk about some of the negatives. And the big one is, is his personnel usage and his, his roster management. I, I have not been a supporter of what he's done with this defensive roster. It, it seems like anytime we have this injury or we have a COVID addition, the first instinct for him is to go to the Broncos or the Rams and sign one of his former players. And look, I understand. He knows those players better than a random free agent like Russell Douglas or you know, some other impact free agent that could potentially be better than the player he's signing. He knows that those players have played in a scheme similar to his and that they could onboard them pretty quickly. I understand that. It doesn't mean I support those decisions because like they signed Eric Banks, Trey Marshall, Isang Bassi, Devontae Harris, like, Devontae Harris might be the only one who made a positive contribution to this team. And it was like three special teams tackles or something like that. So I haven't understood Staley's personnel decisions. We're going to get to the big one in just a sec, trust me. But I'm also going to, I also understand that he's only had one year of calling plays before joining the Chargers. He's never had full control of a roster like this where he gets to make decisions and he you know, this could just be a learning experience for him as well like this is his first year as head coach and he still finished with a winning record like I'm not I'm not jumping off the ship I'm just lowering my you know how much support I had for him initially just because I didn't see I didn't know how his personnel decisions were going to turn out and it hasn't been good which leads me to the big one and the one that I am I still don't understand, and I didn't support it while the game was going on. And that was the Kenneth Murray stuff. 
right after the game, if you follow me on Twitter at ArjunMen in 100, you would have seen that I tweeted out Kenneth Murray finished with like a 28 PFF grade, which got lowered to a 27 PFF grade um, when all the stuff was finally reviewed. The fact that Kenneth Murray was the third down linebacker in a game like that is baffling. Statistically, Kenneth Murray has been one of the worst linebackers since he's entered the league. Even in college, he had like three pass breakups in four, in four years at Oklahoma as a middle linebacker or outside linebacker. You know, when Brandon Slade got hired, Kenneth Murray was one of the guys where I was like, okay, he's not going to be used as a drop into cover three hook zone type linebacker. We're going to get to see him blitz more. He's going to be attacking more in run fits. Nothing happened. And he was so – he wasn't good at his job. I'm not going to call him bad because he's an NFL player, and it takes a lot to get drafted in the first round. Good to have some type of freakish athleticism or talent to get drafted in the first round. But he wasn't good at his job early in the season at inside linebacker that the Chargers moved him to edge, and he, he didn't play well there either. And so the fact that he was the guy that – the Chargers wanted in the most high stakes, high pressure situations on defense. It just, it doesn't make sense. It, there's no, like, it, there's no way that Brandon Staley and that defensive staff and their analytics guys and whoever helps with the game planning came up with the idea and stuck with it that Kenneth Murray was their best option on third down because he's the best man to man covers linebacker on the team. If Drew Tranquil, Tranquil was really that hurt, he shouldn't have played. Because at the end of the day, Kaiser is a, is a better linebacker than Kenneth Murray. Tranquil is a better linebacker than Kenneth Murray, obviously, when fully healthy. I, I just don't understand taking Kaiser off the field when he's had a career year. He has, I think, three interceptions. It just it question, it makes me question what is really happening and it, it makes me question, and this leads me to my final point, how much of an influence Tom Telesco has during the season? Because there is a, there is a complete fallacy in NFL roster building and NFL game planning that first round picks tend to get overvalued. And even though they suck and they're not performing up to their expectations, they still get playing time over players that have proven to be better than them at their role. And I think this is another case of that. Like, you know, Kaiser and Tranquil are both fourth round picks, day three picks, I think. Unless Kaiser, yeah, Kaiser was round four. Like, and Kenneth Murray is round one. So I'm it, it, like, I'm wondering, is, is this one of those situations where because Kenneth Murray is a first round pick and because they traded up for him, is that why they played him in this big of a game? Did Tom Telesco and you know, the scouts have an influence that, hey, we want to see Kenneth Murray. Like, we think he's the better option because we traded up for him. Like, we made the big investment. The Anthony Lynn era was all about selecting Tillery and Kenneth Murray in back-to-back first rounds at the end, you know, in the back half of the first round. And, I mean, I'm not going to say Kenneth Murray indirectly lost in the game because there were a ton of defensive things that happened that, you know, weren't really directly on him. But, like you watch that game and you see that pass interference on Jalen Richard. Yeah. There was a defensive holding that would have got them the first down anyway, but Kenneth Murray just runs into him. Like, like he's a, a rookie in, in his first game. Like that is, that is just unacceptable. I, I just don't see how he got more playing time or he got playing time on third downs over Kaiser white in the most high stakes game of the year, the chargers turned to the player who they changed his position and they changed him back and he got more playing time than tranquil he got more playing he played in a more important situation than the guy that's probably gonna get like seven eight mil in free agency this year so you know to pretty much to wrap it up it like i i support brandon staley i think he's he's gonna be a great head coach i think you know year one for any head new head coach is is always going to be a learning experience i think the main takeaway is I think he set a really good bat, like a really good foundation with good players. I think the process to his decision-making in game is sound and it's been proven that, you know, he's, 
he's doing good stuff. It's helped them win games. Now it's all, next year. It's all about improving on that decision making, improving on the play calling in those high stakes situations. And I think you know, with another year to kind of evaluate and review all the decisions he made in terms of personnel, he'll get better at that also. And we have a ton of cap space for him to construct a defense, for him to construct an like the right side of the offensive line, the receivers can just construct an overall roster in the image that he wants. Because at the end of the day, this defense was built to, for Gus Bradley. It was built for the Legion of Boom, cover three, single gap uh, run structures and all of that stuff, all right? This is not his defense because he drafted Asante Samuel and that's the only new starter on that defense since last year. So, like I said, I think Steely will be fine. Um, you know, it just needs to clean up a little, some of the personnel decisions, but with all the money and with all the cap space and all the draft picks that we have, I'm not worried at all going into next year. And, you know, with Herbert playing like how he's playing, it wouldn't surprise me if the Chargers are, you know, Super Bowl contenders at this point next year. And that's, that's just it. So guys, you know, it's been a really fun year, you know, talking ball and the season was really fun to watch. I hope you guys enjoyed my videos and the Chargers in general. And with that, as always. Bolts up.